Hello and welcome to another episode of Ken Training where we want to give you the training that you need to tackle projects like this one on your own. Today's project is going to be educational training in a classroom type style in which we are going to do a deep dive into the venting characteristics for a water heater. So we're going to look at this water heater in my house as an example and we're going to explore if this one meets the current code requirements for installation. We're going to be using code book. Now a couple of code books we're going to use is uh, this code book here and I'll have links below into these particular books but Code Check Complete Second Edition is one of them and we're also going to use the 2012 Uniform Mechanical Code. So I'll be uh, toggling back and forth between these two code books reviewing this installation, determining if it, if it meets current code. Mind you, this one was installed 18 years ago by someone in the past, 18 years ago, uh, not, not, not installed by me. And so we're going to do a review of this. This video will be good for people who are home inspectors, who are looking at homes and performing inspections to determine uh, how the installation, um, if it meets code, current code or not. Also, it will be good for people who are DIYers, who are looking to uh, replace their own water heaters or <clears throat> someone else's water heater and how to determine if the uh, installation meets code compliance. Specifically we're going to be focusing on the venting system. This is a ga natural gas water heater and we are going to be looking at the venting system for the products of combustion for the water heater. We'll explore a couple other uh, side things but our main focus today is just going to be on the water heater venting. So that's it. I am trying, going to try to give you a great video uh, with the shortest amount of time possible and I only ask for you to do one thing for me and that is to smash that like button right now. And with that, let's go on with the show. <laughs> Okay, let's move on with our training and presentation. So we are going to look at gas water heater inspection and code violations on venting. See if you can find all the violations on our example of my water heater in my house. Let's move on. The code books that we, we will be using for the exercise are the uh, 2012 Uniform Mechanical Code and based off of the 2009 codes, Code Check Complaint. Code Check Complete Second Edition. If you are a home inspector, this is the book that I recommend you acquire for your home inspection training and verification of installations. It's great. It has four trades in one, and it's a very good book. I'll try to leave links below so that you can purchase these books on your own accord. Items to look at to be code compliant. We will be using the IRC, International Residential Code, the UMC, Uniform Mechanical Code, the UPC, Uniform Plumbing Code for this exercise. In the real world, you need to contact the AHJ, which is the authority having jurisdiction, to determine the code that they will follow for your installation. Because at the end of the day, that's all that matters, is that you are code compliant for your installation. You get a signed off permit in, uh, on your installation, and that is what you need. Items to look at to be code compliant. We want to look at the appliance category and the pipe allowed for that category. Number one. Number two, the length of the pipe for the installation and the minimum and maximum distances and clearances. Number three, diameter of pipe for insulation and size of water heater. What we're presenting today is not all inclusive, but it's to help and give you a good idea and understanding and further training on what to look for to be code compliant for your installation. Now, we are going to be looking at this water heater here. It's a natural gas water heater, and here's your vent pipe up at the top, and it's a metal vent pipe, not plastic. So it should tell you that this is a category one appliance. There's no fan, so it's going to have a non-positive static pressure, and there's no condensate, so it, it's category one. Typical vent is a type B vent. 
tells you here under appliances, by the way, they call a water heater an appliance according to the code terminology. The listed category one appliance with a draft hood, by the way, I know it's not a great picture. There is a draft hood on the top of this water heater. Uh, an appliance is listed for B vent. It tells you that the type of vents that the code will allow are type B gas vent, chimney, single wall metal pipe, listed chimney lining for gas, and a special vent listed for the appliance. Here is the IRC and UMC code sections that you can find for this information. Now, this isn't related to the vent pipe, but it's just something that is related to water heaters that I thought was of interest. The TP and RV discharge may discharge into a pan on the IRC, but it is not allowed in the UPC. What's interesting is how the, the codes differ amongst themselves. So not all codes are the same. That's why you got to communicate with your AHJ to determine what you have to do for your installation. For our installation, the required pans and drain. You need a pan at the bottom of this to be code compliant because a watertight corrosion resistant pan is required for water heaters and attics or where leakage could cause damage. If this water heater were to leak, it's going to leak on the drywall. It's going to cause building damage right there. So you could argue that there is a violation not having a pan. This is not a pan underneath this water heater. Now, also for the discharge of the TPNR V valve, this water heater, the TPNR V valves at the top, discharges down here and then exits the room. You do not see the discharge in the same room that the water heater is located in. Discharge to be read into readily observable location. So you could argue that because it's not in the same room, it's not readily observable. In my installation, you just have to open this door and the discharge would be visible because this is discharging right to the outside of the residence onto a cement walkway within six inches of the ground. So um, I like this installation better because if the TPNRV valve were to discharge because of a water heater, the thermostat is basically running away, it's malfunctioning, you have heat on, the thermostat should be satisfied, but for some reason it's not. You're, bu you're still building up temperature and pressure within your system and you got to relieve that pressure through your safety valve. That's where the TP and RV valve comes into play and it discharges that water and pressure to make sure that you don't create a bomb in your house. We need to know terminology when we communicate. You have the water heater. The water heater discharges the natural gas water heater discharges out to a draft hood. The draft hood is at the top of the water heater. That connects onto a vent connector, which is this pipe here. The vent connector connects onto a vent or vent pipe. So don't call the vent leaving the roof as of the vent connector and don't call this pipe over here. Do not call it the vent because it is the vent connector. So when you look at your code and it's talking about single wall vent, what they're talking about is single wall vent is this here. This is the vent. You have to so make sure you get your terminology down. Now we're looking at pictures and determining if we're within code. You have a vent connector. It's installed on a slope. That slope per code has to be a minimum of one quarter of an inch per foot. On my cell phone, I have an app called Pitch factor. I take my cell phone, I put it right up against the bottom of that pipe and I snap the picture and it produced this shot. That's telling me that I have a one inch per foot slope. The minimum is one quarter of an inch per foot slope. So we exceed the code, which is good. It's good to exceed the code's requirements. So we are code compliant on slope. Uh, measurements. You have to get plenty of measurements when you do this sort of thing. You have to have your tape measure readily available. We need to know the length of the vent connector. We need to know the height from the draft hood, in this case, up to the ceiling to where it connects onto the vent. And that is 17 inches and 65 inches for the vent connector. You're right in front of the water heater. There's a data plate. Here's the data plate blown up. You need to get that picture. You need to know what the input is in BTU per hour when we look at our vent tables. We have a code violation. Single wall 
vents are not allowed in dwellings. You're not, according to the Uniform Mechanical Code, you cannot go past this penetration and, and have a single wall vent pipe. This installation is a single wall vent pipe. It would be good to know what um, single wall and double wall vent pipes look like. Single wall vent pipe looks different than double wall vent pipe because it has two layers of metal, so an inner wall and an outer wall. This vent, vent pipe that we connected onto doesn't have that. It only has one wall. So it is a single wall vent pipe and per code, it's not allowed in dwellings. And this is a house, it's a dwelling. Okay, once we exited the ceiling of the garage, we now enter into the attic space above the garage. You need to know the measurement from the, uh, how, when it enters the attic space to where it leaves the roof line. In our case, it's 23 inches, single wall vent pipe. There's a clearance to combustible materials. The minimum is six inch clearance to combustible for single wall metal vent pipe. This picture shows you that you do not have six inches. That's a code violation. Next is when the vent pipe enters onto the roof. You want to measure from where it enters the roof to where, it, uh, to where the bottom of the termination cap is to determine the pipe length. In this case, it's 18 inches. If there's a wall or structure nearby, you want to know what that distance is from the wall to the vent pipe. In our case, it's four feet. So get these measurements while you're right there. In addition to that, you want to take your app that you have on your phone, Pitch Factor in my case, and you want to get a picture of the slope of this roof. In this case, it is 912. You cannot comfortably walk on a roof that has a slope greater than 612. So if you have a 912 roof, the that's telling you you cannot easily walk comfortably on this roof. So you're, you're going to pretty much stay off of it due to the slope. In addition to that, the, the roofing material is a fiber cementitious tile that becomes brittle with age. This roof is at least 20 years old. If you were to walk on this roof, there is a high likelihood that you could potentially crack one of these tiles. So that's something you want to avoid. So due to the material that the roof is made out of and the slope, basically you're not, for an inspection purposes, you're not gonna to wanna to walk on this roof. Are, do we have any violations in this picture? Well, for single wall vent pipes, you need to terminate a minimum two feet above the roof line. We're only 18 inches, that's a code violation. If you have another building, a roof or wall or whatever within 10 feet of the vent termination, which we do, then you need to terminate a minimum two feet higher. Obviously we're not higher, so that's another code violation. This is a picture of the same roof just taken from a different perspective so that you could uh, further back so that you could see the wall and what everything looks like. If you were to take and leave and come out this vent penetration, this pipe would have to extend higher than this with the 210 rule. It's going to be up here to the sky. Now, this is taking all the pitch uh, pieces of the puzzle and stitching it all together in one frame so that you can see exactly what the distances are. And the reason why is because the code wants to know what the height is from the flue collar all the way to the vent termination cap. In our case, it's 17 inches plus 23 plus 18, which is right here, 58 inches. Single wall metal pipe shall terminate not less than five feet in vertical height above the highest connected appliance draft hood outlet or flue collar. Well, guess what? We're 58 inches. You need to be a minimum of 60 inches. That's a code violation. We missed it by just that much. Next slide. Another thing that the code looks at is it looks at the 
relationship of the length of the vent connector compared to the uh, vertical pipe here. The vertical pipe we know is 58 inches. We know everything is single wall. The maximum horizontal length of a single wall connector shall be 75% of the height of the chimney or vent, except for an engineered system. This is not an engineered system. Okay, you take your vent height, which is 58 inches in our example, and from measurement taken from the draft hood flue collar all the way to vent termination, the total height, we're going to get 75% of that. That equals 43.5 inches. Our vent connector is 65 inches, so that is a code violation because it is more than 75%. Would this work if we ran the whole pipe in B vent? Okay, if we ran this whole thing in B vent rather than single wall, the code gives you 100% of the vertical to allow for the vent connectors horizontal distance. But 100% of 58 inches equals 58 inches, you are still 65 inches, that's a code violation. It would not work. Oh, by the way, talking uh, now just talking about the section 802 802.10.8 support. You'll see in the picture there's only one support here in the middle. The vent connector shall be supported for the design and weight of the material employed to maintain clearances and prevent physical damage and separation of the joints. It has to be a sturdy installation. You could argue that due to the length of this vent pipe, you should have two support straps, one on this end and one on this end. But I can tell you that I put my hands on this pipe and it's rigid and nothing is coming apart. It's a solid installation. Okay, now we want to see if we are within eight feet from a wall or parapet to the vent pipe. In our case, we are. If you are less than eight feet, then you have to go to figure 30, which is right here, and then that's where the 210 rule comes into place. Otherwise, if you had the eight feet of clearance, you could look at table eight. Let's look at the next slide. Table eight is telling you that depending upon your roof slope, in our case, it's a 912. And if it's greater than 812 up to 912, you need a minimum height of two feet. So you could be code compliant if you move the pipe from here at four feet over to eight feet and you terminated at a minimum of two feet, you would be code compliant for this section of the code. Okay, would this work if we ran the whole pipe with B vent? We now have brought the pipe out to the eight foot distance so that this pipe would make it. Instead of 65 inches, we're moving it over to 113 inches. In order for you to be code compliant with this installation and keeping this portion of the code and being compliant with it, we would need to be 113 inches tall because we're 113 inches long and the uh, horizontal means that this pipe here exiting the roof would have to be 73 inches to be code compliant. This is what that installation would look like. You'd have to come out eight feet and you'd have to come up here 73 inches and you would be code compliant. Okay, would this work if we ran the whole pipe with B vent? 113 inches, 73 inches. The, uh, the vent connector is three inches. The whole pipe here is three inches on the existing pipe. There's a table. Uh, 80321 that tells you with the three inch diameter connector. The maximum connector horizontal length can be four and a half feet. Ours would be 113 inches. So we exceed that. Now you are allowed to exceed it, but when you do exceed it, you have to reduce, depending upon how much you exceed it, by a certain number of percentages. So you go from, if you exceed it by double, so four and a half feet up to nine feet, then you have to reduce in the tables by 10%. In our case, we're, we exceed the nine feet, we're 
we're, we're at 9.4 feet, so we would actually need to reduce it by 20% so to, in order for us to meet code. So now we have to look over at the code section to determine what we're looking at. All right, now we are looking at the event tables from the code. Now, let me tell you, there are many, many vent tables in the code section. And if you want to get good at this sort of thing and you want to look at your tables and codes to determine if you're code compliant, you have to just double check and triple check that you're looking at the right venting table to determine if you have, if your, if your numbers and your data are going to be accurate. Now, in the scenario that we're proposing here, everything is run in type B uh, vent pipe, the connector pipe and the vent pipe. So we have type B double wall gas vent, and this is a single appliance. We're not venting in common with other appliances. It's a single appliance, so make sure you have that category correct. We are, this is a category one type appliance. We already know that from earlier in the code. The appliance, excuse me, the appliance vent connection is connected directly to the vent. So the vent connector is connected directly to the vent, which we are. Okay, so we have the correct table to look at to look at our numbers. Now, the table gives you a value of 36,000. Where did you get 36,000 from? You have to know how many feet you are in the horizontal and how many in the vertical. Okay, we are 113 inches in the horizontal and in the vertical. 113 divided by 12 equals 9.4 feet. Round that to the next highest number, which is 10 feet. So the height is going to be in the 10 foot section. The lateral, you have to go down to 10 foot on the lateral. So we know that this is the correct row that we want to look at. We have a three inch diameter vent connector. Three inches is here. It's a natural gas appliance. There's no fan. So we have to look at this column here, natural maximum. 1010 10 is the row. That tells you 36. This number is in thousands of BTU per hour. So the maximum size the appliance can be under this scenario is 36,000. Well, what do we have? We have 40,000. We exceed the 36,000. So we have to go to the next highest number, which is a four inch vent pipe. Four inch vent pipe at 1010. 10, will give you 70,000. But now we have to go back one slide and we have to look to determine what a four inch pipe will give you. It will go only go up to six feet before you have to start reducing it. You can go from six feet to 12 feet, but you have to reduce it by 10%. So we now can look at the four inch vent pipe, goes up to six feet, but we have to derate it by 10%. Uh, up to 12 feet, so 70,000 times 0.9 equals 63,000 BTU. We only have to have a capacity greater than 40,000 or greater, and we are greater at 63. We would be code compliant with a four inch vent pipe. You want to install the smallest size pipe possible for economics and for the health of the system. A smaller pipe will heat up faster than a larger pipe. And, uh, when you heat up your vent pipe, it will also help promote draft through the system, which is what you're trying to achieve. You want draft. That is the whole reason for this, so that you are properly drafting the products of combustion through your vent system and out of the residence. That is the whole purpose of this code in vent tables, so that you have the proper draft that the appliance venting system produces the appropriate draft to prevent the occupant from dying of carbon monoxide poisoning. That is the purpose and the reasoning behind why all this is done, all for safety. Okay, so would this work if we ran the pipe in B-Vent? Yes, but you have to have a four inch pipe and that pipe has to be above the roof line by six feet. So it has to be pretty tall. Okay, so this is basically if you were to purchase a brand new water heater. Now, in my case, I chose the manufacturer A.O. Smith. There are three main manufacturers in my area, Ream, A.O. Smith, and Bradford White. A.O. Smith 
in my opinion, has a higher reliability factor than Ream. The AO Smith has a, a anode rod on the top that has a separate port for the anode rod. The Bradford white water heater, the anode rod is built into the hot water discharge line, which means that if you want to change out or check your anode rod, you got to disconnect the hot water piping on the Bradford white water heaters. I don't like that. So, so for that reason, I like the AO Smith, which are readily available at Lowe's. Now, the water heater, uh, if I was to go and purchase this, I, by the way, the one that's at the house now is a 50 gallon. I put in here a 40 gallon because the house only really needs a 40 gallon. We don't have more than four people in the residence. And if you look at the recovery rate and the first hour rating, you're going to produce 72 gallons. There's plenty of hot water for everybody. Okay. Oh, estimated yearly cost according to your energy guide. Oh, and another thing, this thing is readily in stock at my local Lowe's. The estimated yearly cost is $220. I actually did not believe that number. I thought it was too low. So I pulled out my own energy bills from natural gas and I'm averaging $27.88 a month with two appliances, a clothes dryer and a water heater. I allocated one third of the usage for the dryer and two thirds of the gas usage for the water heater. That breaks down to a yearly water heater cost of energy, $220, which actually precisely matches this $220, which I thought was ironic. But so you can trust these energy guide numbers. Okay, now I want to present to you another option. Another option is to install a direct vent water heater. Can we install the below water heater within code in my residence. This water heater is what's called direct vent, which means that the intake air comes in the same pipe that the exhaust flue gases. It, it, this is actually a pipe within a pipe. You only see one pipe, but there's actually two pipes here. There's an outer wall and an inner wall pipe. The inner wall pipe is ex, uh, having the products of combustion leave the residence. The intake air comes in surrounding the inner wall pipe to feed the combustion air into the water heater. It, uh, this water heater is definitely FEIR compliant because it's getting its air from here and not from the garage. So it can be installed on the floor. It has the little feet on the uh, bottom of the water heater, which I do like that, I, rather than the water heater resting directly on the floor. I like the little legs. Okay. For what the code says, for a direct vent appliance, you have to have the type of vent that is AMI. What's AMI? That's according to the manufacturer's instructions. What that means is, is you need to now go to the manufacturer, in my case, A.O. Smith, and you have to pull up their installation manual for this model. And oh, by the way, where I live in Orange County, California, uh, you have to have ultra low NOx in order to be code compliant because this is the only water heaters that they allow for gas water heaters in my area. Okay, so but we have to look at the code book, uh, the installation manual, instead of the code book to be code compliant. We have to install it according to the manufacturer's instructions. The energy use of this water heater is $205 a year. It has a medium uh, first hour rating of 64 gallons, not as good as the other water heater, but still not bad. The problem is it has a one month lead time. These are not readily in stock. If you want this and you ordered it today and you wanted a water heater, you'd be without hot water in your house for one month if your water heater completely failed. Okay, to be code compliant, according to the manufacturer's instructions, we need to have certain dimensions that we meet in order to install the water heater per their instructions. Let's look at dimension A. Dimension A for a 40 gallon water heater has to be a minimum of 68 inches. Now this water heater that's currently in the residence is sitting on a platform that's 24 and a half inches tall. 57 inches tall for the water heater and then 17 inches tall above that. If we were to take this water heater and install it on the platform, we 
would still meet the minimum requirement of 68 inches because 17 plus 57 equals 74 inches. So we would meet Dimensions A's minimum requirements, even if it was installed on the platform. This unit can be installed on the floor. Clearly, we would be within, we would, we would make, meet, meet that expectation requirement, that measurement. Now, Dimension B, from the exiting wall to the center of the water heater, the B dimension has to be a minimum horizontal of 22 inches. Well, the water heater diameter is 22 inches. If the water heater was installed directly against the side and back walls, it wouldn't have enough clearance. We would not have 22 inches. We have to have 11 inches of clearance minimum from the side wall, which is this wall here on the garage, to the water heater to meet clearance B. So we just have to keep that in mind. This water heater would have to be pushed over. Now we have to see how the, the vent is going to terminate the residence and to make sure that we meet all of these clearances according to the manufacturer's instructions. The most important one in our case is B, and we have to be nine inches minimum clearance on the top and side of a window or door that may be opened, and you do not install below a window or door that may be opened. Now, this is a picture of the side of the residence. See that door of the water heater? That's the same door right here. And the roof line here is right here where that yellow lot, uh, yellow um, circle is. So our vent termination could, could terminate right here. If we were to blow out this stucco, we could install the vent termination uh, right here. And that's 14 inches above the window. And the, it is above the door as well, above the window and door, 14 inches. The code said that we had to be nine inches minimum clearance on the top and side of a door. So clearly we're gonna make that meet that by four, being 14 inches. There's a couple of operable windows here. And uh, this window we don't need to worry about because we're above it. This window, we are to the side of it, more than nine inches, we're five feet. So we meet all of those requirements. Okay, now we want to look at another option. Another option is to install a power vent water heater. See the power vent motor right there. Can we install the below water heater within code? This water heater is $1,300. It's an AO Smith FVIR. And a couple of information here about the diameter and the height of the unit. By the way, when they take the height of this unit, they take it from the bottom of the water heater to, the, to right here, the top of the fan. That's all considered the water heater. <clears throat> First of all, let's put this in a category. It's gonna be a type four. It is a condensing water heater. The static pressure of the venting system is positive. So the typical vent system is going to be plastic. The way that you install this is according to the manufacturer's instructions for a type four, type four water heater. This water heater is gonna cost you $282 per year. Now, isn't that interesting, folks? This water heater, which is supposedly energy efficient, it's so cold it produces condensate on the flue venting gases, costs more to operate than a natural gas and direct vent water heater. It has a really good uh, first hour rating of 76 gallons, which is the same as the first water heater in our in our series here, which had just nat, uh, just a gravity natural gra draft system. This particular water heater, unlike the direct vent, is in stock. There's It's low in stock, but it is in stock at my local Lowe's. Now, it is an FVIR compliant, so it can be installed on the floor. It's uh, also gonna be an ultra low NOx, which is what I require for my area. And now we have to go to the book here to determine how to install it within their manufacturer's instructions. The manufacturer says you can use two inch schedule 40 PVC. 
it tells you that you can use medium and long sweep elbows, but you can, uh, but you cannot use a 90 degree, sh what they call a short uh, vent elbow. So you can't use this would be considered incorrect. You have to look at your tables to determine how many feet you need to install. Now they give you a maximum of 35 feet with one elbow. We're going to be less than that because our installation is so tight. We're, you know, we're right up against an exterior wall. And another thing here is that the total length of the vent pipe is less than 20 feet. If it's less, less than 20 feet, it is recommended that you install the debris screen. They want a certain amount of restriction going on in here. So see that restrictor pipe, debris screen with restrictor? We're going to be less than 20 feet. They want that installed uh, to make sure that you have a certain amount of pressure on the system to operate properly. So here's our installation. And would this installation work for us? We would terminate over here, our clearances and everything. Okay. So here, our type, uh, excuse me, our, our B section here for our clearances tells us we need to be 12 inches minimum clearance on the top or four feet clearance below or to the side of a door or window. And let's look at that. Uh, by the way, we are, we are going to make that 12 inches and four feet because we're we are at five feet and 14 inches. So we do, we are code compliant. We are uh, manufacturers compliant and code compliant with our vent termination being in this location right here. Okay. Another thing they want on the installation of this uh, power vent water heater, they want you to have a downward slope on the horizontal pipe exiting the residence on the sidewall terminal. So that way, if there is condensate here, it drips and drains out of the unit this way. Um, the, you have to be a minimum of 12 inches above grade or the anticipated snow level. You need to be a minimum pipe length is three feet with one elbow. Now that's important because we are going to have a short installation. On our installation, we have to put the unit on the floor, which we would want to do anyways, and protect it with a bollard. We know that the water heater is 68.88 inches. We're at 29.5 inches from the top of the water heater to the ceiling line. If we install the water heater right here, uh, we have one elbow at the top of the installation. We would be at 25 inches, uh, taking into account the four inch loss due to the medium sweep elbow, uh, plus 13 inches exiting the residence this way. That gives you a total of 38.5 inches of pipe length, not, inclu not including any, anything with the termination. We would meet the minimum requirements of the three foot pipe length, so we would be good. Okay, I'm just looking at another option here. What about a water heater that produces no flue gases at all. This is an electric water heater and they call it a hybrid water heater. Hybrid heat pump water heater. That's what the, this particular unit is. It's expensive at $1,700. But check out the next slide. This water heater is only gonna cost you $104 per year to heat the water for your family for an entire year in electrical costs. So to run this unit is very, very inexpensive. You've never seen a number like this, $104 in the entire presentation. It's extremely inexpensive to run. So you do get a payback. Over 10 years, you're going to save $1,000 in energy consumption by operating this water heater. There are some drawbacks to this unit. This is just some spec on the unit with the uh, first hour, uh, the delivery of 65 gallons and other things. I put in a larger tank here because the recovery is a little bit slower on this water heater. Here is some installation instructions. Because this is a heat pump unit, there's a small air conditioning unit here that produces and takes out condensate 
from the air that passes through it because there's an evaporator coil here. And that is going to produce condensate. You got to deal with that condensate. You need a certain amount of airflow because um, this water heater has a small heat pump here. And just like a refrigerator, the refrigerator needs airflow and this thing needs airflow. So you can't have a closed door like this. You need to have a louver door if it's in a closet. They like you to have a minimum of 700 and cubic feet of space in the room. Otherwise, you need to have a, a louvered door. You could duct in your intake air and your exhaust air as shown. You're going to need to install electricity for this electric water heater. You're going to need a 30 amp breaker with 10 gauge wire. It's 240 volt circuit. So you need two breakers, single phase, 240 volt in order to do your installation for this 4,500 watt water heater. You could directly vent to the outside as depicted here, taking in your intake air and your exhaust air as shown. Um, draining the water heater. So there is a little bit of preventive maintenance with this water heater. So routine preventive maintenance for the water heater. There's an air filter up here that every month that you should clean. It's a washable filter. So you have to uh, rinse it out with water. They once a year want you to operate the uh, PT and RV valve. That goes through with any water heater. You should be operating the pressure temperature relief valve once a year. You, they want you to clean this filter element here. And if you have to, you can use a mild detergent um, every so often. And they actually give you a filter reminder uh, 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 on the machine. The display will tell you when to clean the filter. At least once a year, pour a cup of bleach in the access opening of the condensate drain. Just like an air conditioning unit that has produces condensate they want you to uh, treat the condensate drain line here with uh, once a year, pour a cup of bleach right down the drain, the condensate drain line to help kill any mold or algae or mildew that's formed inside of that uh, condensate drain line. And just like any water heater, the water heater's tank can act as a basin to collect solids. They want you to blow down the uh, bottom of the tank through the drain valve every month to clean the tank of these deposits. But that's good for any water heater, not just this uh, electric hybrid heat pump. A lot of utility companies are giving you rebates. My utility company is offering you a $500 rebate. There's a federal tax credit of $300 if you buy a, a certain water heater, as long as it has a UEF rating of 309, ours has a uniform energy factor of 3.75, so we meet that requirement, you'll get these prices. So your $1,700 water heater is now costing you $900, and it only costs you $100 a year to operate. In 10 years, this thing basically paid, in nine years, this water heater is paid for itself with these rebates. Uh, here's the same thing. This, by the way, this is a ream, and this is basically the same thing, but it's in an A.O. Smith water heater. Okay, that is going to conclude this video. If you got any information out of this video at all, please click that like button for me right now. If you have any questions about the information that was presented in this video, please leave it in the comments below, and I will do my best to respond to your questions as they come up. Subscribe to my channel, Ken Training, and we'll catch you on the flip side.